Welcome to another episode of the Dreams to Reality podcast and today I've got a very very special guest and an extremely tall one as well. Professional basketball player Daniel Edozi. Hey Cameron Parker, thanks for having me here man. What's going on my man? Hey nothing much, you know what I mean? Staying positive, got, got late night training tonight but hey I want to focus on this podcast and you know let my message be known to people out there and you know that I have a lot to share and trying to inspire okay. them in so many ways. So we're going to dive straight into it but but can you remember a conversation we had probably about a year and a half ago? Can you remember? I do remember that conversation. It was a, yeah, it was a sure. face. It was a FaceTime call, and obviously I'm a motivational speaker. You are too. So we kind of talked a little bit about how we could collaborate, and obviously we both live busy lives, so nothing really kind of happened. But it was good that we got the opportunity now to really sit down, talk, and I'm sure that after this, we can probably talk about how we may be able to work together. That's what I would like. Oh, that's what you like. Hey, man, I'm, I'm, I'm happy with that. You know what I mean? Like, I, I do remember the conversation that we had and talking about, you know, exchanging information and exchanging ideas and whatnot yeah. and just kind of like letting each other know that we're on the same page and eventually like if, if it does come to a case where like you said we can't collaborate and like do something together then yeah i'm happy to make let's, big things happen you know what i mean let's make something happen for sure <laughs> let's go, so man. let's start from the beginning hey check this out i got i got something for you right here and this is just something that just hit me the other day <laughs> right now no real talk i got something for you right now see sometimes in life man people ain't gonna believe in you they're not gonna believe in your purpose they're not gonna believe in your mission they're not gonna believe in your vision you know what I mean? They're not even going to believe in, like, your ability to overcome something. You know what I mean? And sometimes your own circumstance in the moment isn't even going to believe in you. But then here's the thing. Here's, here's, like, something that we should all understand today. You know what I mean? And one of the keys, like you said, something like that you have out there is, is confidence. And I looked at that and I was like, that's so deep. Despite only being five foot six. <laughs> I need hey, confidence. But you, hey. hey, but you five foot six with a lot of confidence. You know what I mean? Like, hey, five foot six with confidence speaks six foot eight. You know what yeah, I mean? Like, true. that's big man stuff. But, <laughs> but yeah, no, like, as, and then, so then here's the point, yeah? So when you, when you're like, you, you know, you're in doubt or everything outside of you is against you. You know what I mean? There's that only one person that you can believe in and that's yourself. You know what I mean? And some people got to understand how to believe in themselves and they got to understand that the circumstance that they're going through in that very fine moment isn't to break them down, but it's only to make them stronger. Okay. Sense. You're you're going in deep already. Already. I'm, I'm told but, you. But I listen, told you. I'm going into it. I know what you can do. I know your mindset. I know what you're about. But where did it all begin? Where was you born? Well, you want to go from there? I'm, I'm going. Yeah, you want to go I'm there not just. When I, was born. When, right. I want to know your story. You I, want I, know story. I want to know about you, and then I want to know what you have to overcome to be who you are now, especially to have that mindset you have. Because I don't just want to spit some motivational content or a few rap battles. What we just did. <laughs> what I want to see is. Next <laughs> I know social media and stuff like that is also the highlight reel, but I know that's not always the case. Yeah. So where did it start for you? Where was you born? Okay, so I was born here in London, October 92, um, and I was born here in Greenwich, and I lived throughout my time, throughout my childhood, moving from place to place, so I was moving, I lived in, uh, what was I living, I was living in Abbeywood, moved to Croydon, and Twickenham, and all different places, you know, like, it's, it's almost like this, the path to success, so many things are just winding, you know what I mean, all success is in a straight path, but anyway, um, I, so then my mom and I, so we went back and forth between like many different countries and we went from, what well, we went from England to Africa or came back to England and went back to America to go back to England. Why America? Uh, well, we have family there. Okay. And why Africa? Uh, because we have family there as well. I'm, I'm, I'm Nigerian, by the way. Okay. So I have Nigerian roots. So, so you have family in Nigeria and then you also had family in America. And I also have family in, in London in a, as well. Okay. Yeah. So yeah, I have family like in those three countries. But, um, so when, when I was a kid, moved to, well, what should I say? Like, so when I was in Africa, I lived there for a little bit in Nigeria and I lived in, um, Lagos and uh, Abuja. Was it Abuja or Onisha State? I always get these two places mixed up. Uh, Inuga State, one of those two, one of those two cities in Nigeria. And then, um, I ended up coming back to the UK, London. And then that's when like things just started to kind of take a turn but not saying it took a turn for like the worst but it's almost like okay 
now I just experienced now reconnecting with my roots and seeing some different people, family members. It's almost like now what? You know what I mean? And so, um, so then I ended up moving. Or my mom and I, we ended up living in Norbury here in 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 London, mm. and then stayed there for some time. I was going to school there. I was going to Winterbourne. What what age? What age? So. At this point, I'm 10, going on 11. So that's 19, I'm sorry, that's 2002, 2003, yeah. 2004, in between there. And so um, so then so then I was going to school at the time, living in Norbury. And I was, it, it got to a point where I was in school and there was, there was so many things that was happening outside of, of school that it kind of, what I say, it kind of got the best of me within school. So it got to a point where I didn't have any motivation. I I, I, can, I I now see this, but I didn't have any motivation. I didn't have any desire to go to school. I didn't want to be in school. I was getting sometimes I was getting bullied. Sometimes I was getting into fights. I almost felt like I was there by myself. I was I was alone. You know what I mean? And so so then I ended up, you know, every time I went home or when I went back home after school, it got there was. I remember a time waking up in the morning. Okay, after I came to like some sort of realization and I didn't want to go to school anymore. So I stayed out of school for a while and my mom was, uh, uh, to be honest, I think my mom was working or she was just doing her daily errands. And sometimes like, I was either with my mom or sometimes I was just by myself. And so, and this, like I said, this is between like the age of 10 and 11 or 10 and 12, somewhere in there. And so then, um, so then after a while, like I didn't go to school, like I stopped going to school completely. And after a while, my mom and I, we decided to, well, she decided to go to America, or she wanted to go to America. So, uh, this is back in 2003, right? 2003, we went, to, uh, we went to Boston, okay? And so, going to Boston in 2003, I didn't know what we was doing. I didn't know why we was going to America. I, or, originally, I thought we was going to go there to go see my, my aunties or my uncles in New York somewhere. So, you thought you was going for... Just a short time. Yeah, a short time to go see family. That's what I thought. Yeah, that's what that's what it that's what it usually is every time we went to America, which well we went back in ninety nine, but then we went again in two thousand and four and I thought two thousand and four was gonna be like the year to see family and, and stuff like that. Or two thousand and three was gonna go see family. So um but like I said we didn't. So we stayed in Boston for a matter of I'll say two weeks. We was actually meant to stay there for about three. Or uh, my mom set it up to where we stayed there for about three years. I mean, three, three weeks. And so when, within those three weeks, man, like, you don't even, you can't even imagine. Like, look, first night we got to a hotel. We were, um, we were, we stayed in the Radisson. And then the next night we was out on the street somewhere. Or we didn't have anywhere to sleep. And so, um, and so. So you physically stayed out on the street? Yeah, man, we stayed, we stayed everywhere. Like, I didn't even think that was going to happen. For how long? For t maybe two and a half weeks, maybe. So and you and your mom. Me and my mom, like we was moving around, like we was moving th through the streets. So we was like trying to find somewhere to sleep. So we will stay in like an airport. Or we will stay like in a in a bus station. Or what about food and stuff like that. Somehow my mom had a little bit of cash on her, and she spent it on food yeah, instead she, of she, yeah. Yeah, she tried to get food, you know, try to get food and whatnot. But yeah, we went. So we went through that bit, and that was for two and a half weeks, and. Um, originally there was a lady hit. Now here's where the change happened. Okay. So, um, we were at a airport or we was at the airport there in Boston and my mom and I was just basically relaxing in a place where, um, like, you know, when you leave, when you get off the plane and you go into like the waiting area before you, before you leave, uh, before you leave the actual airport, uh, we was there just relaxing and there was a lady in her child. She came up to, she came to our presence and she was basically asking my mom some questions and I was basically also playing with the child or, you know, she had like a, like a Nintendo DS or Nintendo, you know, 64, something yeah. like that. And, um, and, uh, and I remember just like being engaged and being interactive with him and my mom and the other lady was just talking, you know, they was exchanging conversation. And then after a while, like, maybe like an hour or something like that uh we end up getting up like all four of us and my mom's like asking me to take our bags let's go here or, let's follow this lady like i guess this lady must have knew something that my mom and i didn't so uh we end up going to 
So we end up leaving the airport, and then we go to this office. And um, okay. I remember sitting there in the office, relaxing. And I remember uh, also playing with the kid as well. And then my mom and the other lady was was busy in in, a, in in an office talking to somebody behind the booth or something like that. I guess telling them the situation uh, about like what's going on between us uh, and my mom. And then after that, we end up, uh, after the lady and my mom have finished talking to the lady at the booth, they, those two, they come back to where me and this other kid was like, you know, playing around or whatever. And we, in, in, in a matter of a few minutes, my mom's telling us like, yeah, let's go get some food from here. And then we're gonna get um we're gonna go to a hotel for a couple nights. And I was like, what? What happened there? Like, where did this yeah. come from? So went to go get some food that night. And then, um, and thanks to this lady, I don't know, she she probably was an angel sent from God. You know what I mean? Mm. Like with those, there's certain people that just come into your life and they make a difference. Or they, it's almost like they see something and it's like they already know what you need before you even can get yeah. to your own need. You know what I mean? So it's like they gave you that assistance. So. That night, um, we ended up going to get some food, and then we stayed in the hotel for a couple of nights, showered up, refreshed, and then uh, we ended up coming back to England, like a couple of days later. And it, it was yeah, yeah don't worry, yeah. I know it's, it's it's bizarre, but it's it's a true story, man. And so coming back to England, you know, as a, as a kid at the age of eleven, I was just thinking like, what was that all about, you know, like. We confusing, went, yeah. yeah. Confused, you know. We came, came, went to a place, and it's almost like I wouldn't say you didn't, you didn't accomplish anything, but you went to somewhere you didn't go anywhere, you know. Yeah. So, um, so anyway, came back to England, stayed here for a few months, and within those few months, I didn't go to school again. And my mom, uh, she was, you know, doing whatever she was doing, and then eventually we decided to go back to America. So then this is a couple months later in what's that may of 2004 yeah may of 2004 we end up going back after coming back from america uh after coming back from boston mm. a few months later uh, a few months prior and so go back to america now and this time i think my mom's a bit more familiarized with the territory now and so now that she's familiarized with the territory she knows, she knows what to do knows how to probably properly be more prepared for the journey to come and then um, after, after, uh, after she came to that decision of wanting to go to the States, uh, we ended up going back to Boston, and then we stayed there for about three days. Now, this is where everything completely changes. So we stayed in Boston for three days, and we stayed in the same hotel before we left, uh, before we left to come yeah, back okay. to England. And then... And then after those three days, we end up taking this journey, three day bus bus trip journey, uh, where so we get we get to a, a Greyhound bus stop or bus station in Boston. My mom wants to buy goes ahead and buy some tickets to travel, uh, or to you know to take the bus wherever she's going or wherever she wants to go. And then I didn't know where it was going. I had no clue. I was just on this journey, uh, and I was just basically in the moment of like you know trying to figure out how to make make sense of what's going on so but sometimes trying to understand things you know bef before your eyes you got to learn that. did you not ask i sometimes i did but just my mom's way of answering questions you know she's just it's not like she she sometimes i feel like she probably doesn't even know why oh, okay so but I, I didn't, I couldn't, I couldn't fault her. I couldn't make her think or make her feel a certain way. I was just, you know, I was a kid. I, I was just trying to be humble. I was being humble throughout my experiences. So anyway, we take this bus journey and we go from Boston and we're traveling. One day goes by. Didn't stop anywhere. And I wouldn't say we didn't stop anywhere permanently, but we didn't stop like, yeah. you know, in a trip. Um, two days go by. Still on the bus traveling. Third day comes. Finally, we get somewhere, and now we find ourselves in Las Vegas, Nevada. What? <laughs> yes, I know. I know. Trust me. I was a kid. Look, when I was when I was when I was a kid going through this stuff. Look, I was like, okay, well, what are we doing here? You know. So, so then um, we end up in in Las Vegas, and uh, upon arrival. We didn't even go anywhere. We just uh, we took we got our bags off the bus, and bearing in mind we had a lot of lot of baggage or a lot of luggage, and 
what ended up happening was we uh, stayed at that same that that bus station in Las Vegas, and we just stayed there. Like we didn't know what to do next, so it was just kind of kind of like at a standstill. Now here's the funny thing. The same thing that happened in Boston when that lady came to us and she helped us, the same exact moment happened when we got there a few hours after getting to Las Vegas. And so my mom and I was just were just relaxing, sitting down, and you know, I'm just trying to figure out like, okay, what are we doing? Like where are we going and stuff? And and um the, the, a lady, another lady comes to my mom's presence and she sits down and is just asking questions and stuff like that. About what? Just about life, like what's going on, mm. like, you know? Just some people just randomly come into your life mm. and just ask you, yeah, yeah. ask you and just be engaged with conversation with you. And so um they they're talking, but I'm in my own my own zone. Of course, you're stuff. young too. Yeah, you know, I got other th- my mind is somewhere else, you know what I mean? So mm. um anyway, um, I, I end up coming back to my mom and that lady speaking speaking to each other, and what ends up happening is uh, there they decide now that okay we could we could leave or it's time to leave. I guess they found some sort of resolution to the, the problem at hand with with you know with us or whatever, and they uh, my mom and and the other lady we end up finding like an apartment. You know we we find an apartment and. We're basically looking for housing, and so I guess that's why that came about. And so, find an apartment, stayed there for a week, and now within this week, uh, we just, you know, I wasn't in school, of course, I wasn't able to be in school, but we just just going through the week and just trying to make good, you know, make good experiences with being here in Las Vegas and just experience like something different. And so, and so, okay, after a week, seven days. We end up back on the street, and now we're trying to figure out where are we gonna go now. So uh, after the seventh day, um, the lady somehow and my mom, I don't know what happened in a relationship. Maybe something didn't work out, or ah, I couldn't tell you. I couldn't tell you. But now it's just me and my mom, and we're having to make a decision, and we're faced with having nowhere to go. So uh, we decide to. We, st- we decide to go back to the bus station until we could figure out what to do next. And so now for a stretch of months, okay, after making this decision to be in, uh, be in a bus station, that same day we, we left the, the, the apartment, we ended up being told that uh, there's a shelter down the street, which is called Salvation Army or yeah, Salvation Army actually. And there was housing people housing families, uh, women in specific, women in particular as well. And so uh, we we end up going there. And then we stayed there for for some time, man. And and we stayed there and it was it was a, it was an eye opener. It was com- some it was a completely different world to me. You know, it was it was me at the age of 11 trying to interpret like, well, we went from this to this to that to this, from here to there to there to here. You know, it's just yeah. it's, it's a loop. It's it's a crazy it's a crazy cycle, and so, and the only option that I have is, you know, just trying to keep your sense of like peace within you, so you you can you just know when the time is right to either do something or if something happens dramatic, then you just know that you know you have that that inner strength about yourself, so. Um, anyway, we stayed in the shelter, Salvation Army, for about three weeks. And what, what ended up happening next is we go to, uh, we go to a, a, a flat or another apartment. And in fact, I'm sorry, we, we go to a hotel and we go to the hotel and this is somewhere. So the shelter's over here on this side of town. The, the, the hotel was somewhere else. And we stayed there. For a few weeks, and then, um, and then basically, I ended up being put in school. And so, I, and originally, I went. To, I started going to school when I was at the shelter, but then my mom and I moved. And I was still going to school at the time. I was going to Renato Martinez, and so we go to. Uh, so I'm still going to school, and I'm you know going back and forth between being in this uh, hotel and being in the in the in school as well, and I'm trying to make sense of like 
everything, you know, like outside of school and me having to readjust to a whole new school system and after not being in school for for quite some time. And um, I, I wouldn't say, I, I gave my best shot, you know. I was, I was trying to be the best student that I could. I mean, the teachers probably didn't know, like nobody knew. Like I was, I was completely, I was around completely new, you know, peers and a completely new environment. So I was just trying to adapt. And then after leaving, oh, I'm sorry, after, after uh, we moved to that to that hotel, we end up, you know, during bearing in mind I'm still in school, we end up going back on the streets again. Now, it was times where okay, I was in the shelter to a hotel back on the streets, but at that same time I was still in school. I was still, you know, trying to figure out like okay. You know, I still gotta be in school. I still gotta study. I still gotta still gotta try and be a student and try to be a kid. Yeah. You know, so, um, and so I end up. So after a while, going through some things outside of school, end up finishing school. You know, pat passing grades at least, and thankfully I passed it. And then uh, school's out for the for the holidays or for the summer break. And now uh, my mom and I we decide to take a trip to Los Angeles, and. Now, why did we go to Los Angeles? I don't know why either. But I guess, you know, it's just something yeah, that my mom wanted to do. Yeah. You know? And so, all right. So, my mom and I, we traveled to Los Angeles. Now, going to Los Angeles, what ends up happening is, uh, like I said, n- there's no school going on at, at this point. But we're just in Los Angeles for, you know, for whatever it was there for. And we didn't have any, we didn't have anywhere to stay. You know, after leaving from Las Vegas, getting into Los Angeles, we immediately went to went to Los Angeles and spent some time at that bus stop in Los Angeles. So how old was you? I was I was eleven. Uh, in fact, uh, well, yeah, I was what, eleven. I'm well, in Los Angeles. Yeah, I was eleven in Los Angeles. I turned twelve when I was in Las Vegas. Okay. And so, and so, um, and so now, and so now we're in Los Angeles, right? And. Uh, we're in the bus stop, and we're just trying to make sense of everything that's going on. Uh, I'm trying to make sense of, of what all is going on. And then maybe a few hours later, or later on in that day, somebody gives us a place to go to. And they give or they give recommendation of a place to go to. And we end up going to a shelter called Ununion Rescue, Un- Union Rescue Mission in Los Angeles. And now, where Ununion Rescue Mission is, it's in the heart of Skid Row. Have you ever heard of that place? Never heard of it. Google it. It's a very, very interesting place. Okay. Uh, so Skid Row, basically, I'm just going to give it to you in a nutshell. Skid Row is a place where people are or in a low state of mind. Uh, they're yeah. drug addicts or people who have, you know, like didn't find a way to overcome certain things that happened in their lives or whatever. Um, there's, there's, it's full of drug addicts, full of poverty, for just and it doesn't smell too bad. It's a, it's it's an environment that there's nowhere in England that compared to it. You know what I mean? And so, being in this environment uh, upon arriving in Los Angeles, uh, this 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 is this is another eye opener. It get, this is a completely different view of the world that it gives me. You know, and so um, we stayed there. So we stayed in Los Angeles for about a couple months, maybe or so, and and. Um, during this time, like I was staying in the shelter and going in and out, <clears throat> traveling, seeing the streets, like not traveling, but like just roaming around the streets. Sometimes with my mom, sometimes by myself. And for any other individual that hasn't been to this environment, you go there and you probably be afraid, just a little bit. You know, you'd be a bit intimidated. You, you by by the way that the atmosphere smells or that area, that area smells. It's not nothing that somebody should be. Mm. You know, somebody of that age should be living in or should be exposed to. And I would say, like, I'm not happy that I was exposed to it because at the end of the day, I did learn some things for sure. Yeah, of course. And so, um, was what was it? Also, trying to make friends and or just trying to trying to be a kid. So at what point in your kind of teens or early teens did you start to get some type of stability? Stability. Or did you not have any? Stability in what sense? Just staying in the same place for a couple months or a long period of time or having say a home you went back to from school or was you always on the street or in hotel or in shelters i was always on the street always, up until what age up until the age of uh i say 12 going on 13 the next year when i finally get into the foster care system 
Oh wow! Yeah, no, just look. I haven't, I haven't finished. Okay, it. so you got into the foster care system. Not till the age of well, next year. So two thousand and five is when I went to the foster care system. Okay. And so this is this is basically like the start of two thousand and four. Okay. So yeah. So. So what happened to your mom? What happened to my mom? So what happened to my mom when when I was in the foster well, yeah, care system? Yeah. How did that come about? What transition? What? How? Just how did it happen? So um. Well, my mom, yeah. So when I was in the foster care system, now here's a, here's another part I didn't finish yet. So um, it was a it was a point in my time where my mom and I we traveled from Los Angeles to well was going was going to Florida because we have an auntie there. But within that bus journey, we got stopped in an hour outside of El Paso, Texas. I'm just mm-hmm. saying Texas by immigration. Now, bearing in mind, we we came in 2004. We have a visa that's that only allows us to stay in the country for about 30, 60 days, something like that. And anything past that, you can be you can get into some serious trouble, especially if you get caught. Of course. And so we ended up making a long story short. We got caught uh, being in the country when we shouldn't have, or staying in the country on a on a over you know like an overdue visa. Yeah. And uh, we was basically declared deported. So after being in Texas, um, after we get caught, we stay in Texas for about 30 days, El Paso specifically. We stayed there for 30 days. We had a meeting with an with a, with a, uh, immigration officer. They told us what happened, and this is what's happening. Okay, we have to accept it. And then we end up going back to Las Vegas, uh, going back to Los Angeles. And then Los Angeles was still, was still a mix. It was still me being homeless or, or us being homeless and moving around, trying to figure out what to do. And I changed my life around, took control, to control my own journey, my own destiny, and uh, found myself in the foster care system. And when when I got into the foster care system, they because that immigration case was still pending. I'm in the foster care system. The foster care system was designed to protect me and de- de- designed to protect my situation. Yeah. And they declared that I am, you know, I was legal. Like I was, I was um, declared, you know, legal re- uh, permanent residency and whatnot. And then after that. Uh, they end up sending my mom back. So, oh wow! Yeah, send my mom back to the UK. Wow! And so now I'm in foster care and I'm in a home and uh, I went from Riverside, California, uh, which is an hour and a half outside of downtown Los Angeles. Yeah, I've been to downtown. Then, have you? Yeah. Oh, same. That's good, man. Yeah. Oh, so you know, we didn't stay in the nicest of areas either. <laughs> we got a, we got a friend who's from Los Angeles, so really? when we went over, we stayed with him. Okay. And obviously, it was one of uh, me and my other friend and. We was like, oh yeah, we'll just go out and walk down to downtown. Yeah, yeah. And we was, the area we was in, we was walking, we was like, do you, do you feel slightly out of place here? <laughs> what was like, your... I, I, I can't remember what it was called, but at that time, I remember there was quite a lot of Spanish, uh, Mexicans, and yeah. I w- I'm a small white guy. Yeah, My yeah. friend's a reasonable big like, black guy. Yeah. But we was just walking down and we was like, do you think we just look a bit, like, bit foreign oh, here? Because we're man. probably, I'm wearing, like, probably night bottoms and whatever. Yeah, yeah, we're just yeah. walking down, like, tourists. And we're like, let's walk a bit faster, bro. Felt like some odd ones. Yeah, and then, then all of a sudden, you're, like, walking, you're walking. You're like, Los Angeles don't look like what it looks like on TV. Oh, no, man. You can't, let, you can't let the media get to uh, you. I know. Like, you got to go and see it for yourself. <laughs> <laughs> I went on, like, Hollywood Boulevard at one point as well. I'm like, it just seems like West. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> no, it's, not, it? It, no it's, it's not. It's not what you see on. No. It's not what Los Angeles. You either love it or you hate it. I think, and um, obviously it depends. Depends, doesn't it? I yeah, guess. It depends what you what experience you have, yeah. where you stay, and and things like that. I really liked it, um, but you hear mixed views from people obviously from english people who go to los angeles yeah and they have like a tremendous or dramatic experience yeah yeah experience. It, de- it depends one depends, thing what yeah. shocked me was how many people were homeless that was one thing what shocked me in los angeles yeah. i did not expect that um, i did not expect walking down hollywood boulevard and seeing so many homeless people man, you know what it is too man like that's one thing you do not see uh, it's on, on the media every, i know they don't want to show you that they don't want to show you. They don't want, they don't it's want to bad show you like i'm not gonna lie it's Bad man, there's there's some there's some homelessness in Bristol that you don't even know about. I, right? Nah, I know about like it. Street, you, you street I, yeah, I know it. Yeah. I know about it, but it's 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 ten times it. Ten times it, worse. It's yeah. ten times worse. I'm not yeah. saying it's not a specific case is worse. It's not saying a specific case yeah. is worse. I'm just saying the the amount. Yeah. 
Well, what, what did it mount up to? Like, what did you just do? You every, like every no, just like every corner, everywhere you walked, everywhere, yeah, yeah. every single street, especially downtown. And then yeah, when yeah. I was in a um, what's the beach called? Santa, uh, Santa Mon- Monica. Yeah, beach. Yeah. yeah. And going around, it just um, and like where Gold's Gym and stuff was around there. Yeah. Um. Then we was down. Ah, uh, what's the downtown Long Beach okay and like Long, Long Beach is another it, it, well. yeah so I was, like I was there over the last summer and I was doing some work in, um, uh, in Santa Monica Beach and every time I always got to work early like 6.30 in the morning I'll see like people sleeping on the beach like have nowhere else to go I mean it surprised me yeah it is surprised but I tell you what though now, not saying this in a negative way. At least, at least it's sunny. You know what I mean? It could be worse. Do <laughs> you know what? I it did. Could be worse, I, you know though. what? I did think. That, I thought if there's anywhere I'd want to be homeless, it would probably, <laughs> probably be Los Angeles. <laughs> it's it's true. I, I, I did actually think yeah, that. No, I'm like, well, at least it's not raining. At least it's not like England or somewhere like above the. Yeah, equator, cold like Alaska or some outside. something. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> so then you you was in a foster you was yeah. in the foster system. So then did you did things become a bit I don't want to use the term normal because you probably didn't know any different at that time or did you get start to get into some type of routine I would say I started to get into some sort of routine but it definitely took like some time to readjust I always I wouldn't would say it took time to readjust but it just took me you know took some time to accept and like now what what it is mm. now you know so um, yeah, I was I was with I was with a family now. Um, with oh, you yeah, have a family. I was with a family. I was in a, I was in a home now. Oh wow! Home, like family with like kids and stuff like that. Oh wow! So yeah, I was in, I was in a family. I was in a family home. I stayed there. I only moved once in the foster care system, which is good. Like there's yeah. other cases you hear about kids moving from place to place and then end up in a group home because mm. of a certain behavior, or a certain trait, or a certain characteristics that parents can't handle. They don't yeah. want in their homes. So anyway. Um, stayed there from 2005 and then didn't leave to 2011. Oh, wow. Yeah, I stayed there. I only moved once. So wow. I, I stayed, basically stayed in the foster care system for the duration of my teenage years and my wow. transition into adulthood. Ad- adulthood. And so, yeah, um, what I say, man? Like, I didn't, well, okay, every, every home has its own, like, you know, dynamics. so do you still did for that time? Did you still talk to your mom? Did you still communicate with your mom? Yeah, I tried to talk to her when I can and when I could. Um, do you I, still talk to her now? Yeah, of course, of course. I go see her. I go see her in London. Like, okay, no, no bad feelings, no bad. Do you things. ever talk about this experience? Yeah, I try to from time to time. Um, and how is that? Mom, I mean. It is. It's, it's it difficult, isn't it? Isn't it? Like, it's difficult, isn't it? Yeah, I guess. sometimes you you know it's when not you, a comfortable you, conversation. It's it's not, but then at the same time, like it's not even a matter of like whether it's uncomfortable or not. It's just a matter of like understanding that yeah, look, this is what happened. Yeah, right? that's it. You know, Done. You gotta overcome it. Like you know, yeah. let's move forward. And so, let's go. do you still see your foster family? No, I haven't seen. Well, when I was over the summer, um, in in California, uh, what would I say? I said I met part of my foster family, like kind of like reconnected and and saw them. Was well, that nice or? Yeah, it was good. Positive vibes, man. Positive vibes. And we was just talking about life and talking about, like, my experiences and just exchanging information. It was good. Like, it felt like a family. Like, it cool. felt like so, something positive. College. College. University. What? University. Oh, man. Let's see. So, when did you start playing basketball? Just throughout your whole high school? Yeah, I started playing Have basketball. Have you always been at massive... <laughs> or did you just hit like you know? Oh, hey, I tell you, what, I, I always was the tallest kid in my class, though. Yeah, <laughs> I know. I was always the tallest kid. Even here in England, I was the tallest kid. Wow. Yeah, I know. I know. I must have been growing really fast. Anyway, um, I didn't. So <laughs> <laughs> and so when you got pulled over by the immigration officers yeah, in Texas, like- they was like, "So is this your husband? <laughs> nah, he's my eleven. No! Year, he's, my, he's my eleven year old son." <laughs> <laughs> What you mean, man? <laughs> but yeah, no. Um, that would have been a funny. That would been funny if they if they would assume that. <laughs> so you, you've always played basketball, kind of, or no? No. So I didn't start picking up a basketball until. Well, you know what? To be honest, I actually was kind of in and out of basketball a little bit, but I wasn't playing it as an organized sport or in an organized mm. club setting. Um, I was picking up. I picked up a basketball first time. Very very first time I picked up a basketball, and actually like try to do something with it was when I was in Las Vegas which was about the age of 11 okay um, I went to the store and bought a basketball and just kind of took it up to the park and started shooting with it but didn't think I'd do anything with it and then when um, 
and I was playing 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 with basketball a little bit here and there throughout like my adverse experiences and whatnot. And then I actually didn't start playing with a club until the age of 13, 14. I was, I played middle school basketball, but then shortly after playing middle school basketball, I started to play for an organization called LACD Wildcats, which is an AU program or AU basketball program. And basically with the AU program, it's um or the AU National League is basically like uh you think of like many teams from different cities or different local areas and they can go travel to a city and play in a basketball tournament and whatnot. So that's what that was about. And yeah, that's when I officially started actually playing basketball was at the age of 14. Now, bearing in mind, um, I got injured. I broke my left knee. Well, my left uh, tibia bone at the top. Trying to dunk and trying to take off. or mm. th- But the impact I was putting on that bone during the time I was growing, yeah. like, affected it. And then blew it out. So I had to sit out. I had to sit out for about a year. Um, and then just kind of, like, let it, you know, heal and stuff like that. And then after that, I got right into basketball at the age of 16. And, yeah, was on to it then. You know, mm. I played high school. I played AU during the time as well. I played over the summer. Uh, played in, like, different tournaments throughout the country. Um, whether that was in Las Vegas or Minnesota or... So when did it start to take off for you a little bit? When it started to take off for me a little bit, in terms of what? Just basketball. So how did you essentially become... Did you play in college, university? I did, but not till I finished, well, of course. Because you played in D1, right? Yeah, that was for two years. And okay. And I played at Tyler Junior College for... So you played at Junior years. College for two years. Yep. And then you got a scholarship to D1 or did you... Walk on. No, I got a scholarship to D one. Okay. At, at Iowa State University after finishing at Tyler Junior College in Texas. So how was that experience going D one? It was uh, it was a major adjustment, <laughs> different different intense level, um, which was which was good. Uh, I say that playing at a Division one level, uh, especially like really high up, you kind of learn a lot about yourself, and you also learn about like knowing how to work hard or knowing what it means to be fully committed and being a routine of things and understanding like you know things in a more deeper level thankfully i was under a really good head coach who had been there for like the last three four years or so or so and he was he's uh he went on to coach the nba after i left he went to coach the chicago bulls after oh I wow left. yeah fred hubbard by the way okay and so he was um he was very tactical like within his offense like he, he taught you things about the game that you never think of. And, you know, he's a really good That's guy. That's pretty cool. Yeah, it's pretty cool. Yeah. You know, I'll try to message him here and there and, and whatnot. He's, he's a really good guy. So, um, he was, of course, he was a coach. And our coaching staff, like, I got on, got on well with most of them. And I was just work hard and try to be the best player and best person I could be. So, did you ever have NBA dreams? Somewhat, yeah. When I was, maybe when I was in the foster care system. I th- yeah, I did, but then... Not even when you was playing D1, you're playing at a high level, you didn't think to yourself, I want to go to the NBA, when you're playing, obviously the Division 1s are obviously a very high level. Yeah, of course I did, but then I also thought to myself, well, you know, what's the... What, sometimes you got to come to some senses, you kind of got to think about, like, okay, here's, here, here's how my journey's been so far, if my journey would have led me that way, then I'll be in the direction to go that way, but then... Also thought, well, after I finished Iowa State, that I was just kind of like in the moment or in the moment of just, you know, trying to be poised and be composed with whatever opportunity is going to come next. And then uh, Bristol came, came, came into the picture. How? So I was, so after I finished uh, Iowa State in 2015, over the summer... I was, I was, uh, what was I doing? I was doing a little bit of work and I was wanting to play in a basketball showcase or some, just play somewhere to figure out how can I get an opportunity to play somewhere. Uh, by this point, now my mind is just set on playing overseas. So there was a guy named Daryl Reshaw, and I, I talked to him from time time as well, uh, and he runs like a basketball showcase in Las Vegas. And so uh, I basically went to go compete in that, and that was in July. And the team that I played for, uh, with the head coach for the team that I played for, he was he used to be a coach actually here in England somewhere, and he knows he's good friends with Andres, and so basically he passed along 
Andreas my number or I, I pass along he well we, yeah, we yeah. gave each other contact details. And then uh Andreas got in contact with me and then we just kinda went from there. And then what inspired me truly to come to England was the fact that here's another part. So I have siblings. I have siblings here in England and I only met my brother once come before he, when he came to the States. And um but but prior to that And I, how old's your brother? How old's my brother then or now? Now. What's the he's age 20, gap? He's 21. What's the age gap between you? My, my brother. Yeah. I'm 20. He's 20. I'm 26, 21, five years. Five years, yeah. okay. I was going to say, he's going on 22 now, actually. So same same mum? No. Different moms, same dad. Okay. We all have this, We all have different moms, same dad. Okay. So, um, so yeah. So, my bro- I thought about my brother with the opportunity to come into Bristol. And then I also thought about my sister, who's in Bath. And... Um, you know, Bath is only like 20 minutes from Bristol, 25 minutes from Bristol. And I was like, you know what? It's almost like the answer is right there. So I decided to proceed with Bristol. And, you know, it's almost like this is where it is now, you know? Mm. And so um, I thought about that. And then I'm just like, you know what? There's some, thing, there's some things in life that money came by, you know? Like being able to come here and have a have a relationship with my siblings and then try to reconnect with my mom a bit and then also try to reconnect with my family as well in London. Um, it's almost like, you know, it's, it's, it's just a lot of things I'm thankful for. And those, those, the small things that, that, that may not seem big to somebody else is like big to me. So, uh, cause I'm one of those guys, like I, I value family, of course. And, you know, I'm sure you can understand mm-hmm. that as well. And you value the one relationships thing and stuff like that. So, looking back on your life, what you have been through, yeah. it's not been an easy road. You might not see it like that, but the truth is, a lot of people would really struggle to bounce back or overcome what you've overcome. There's a lot of statistics to support that, as far as... Even it could come down to mental health. It could come down to Absolutely. drug abuse. It could come down to a, a wide range of different things. But one thing was not shocked me because I kind of know what you was like anyway. But you just don't seem to carry any hate in your heart. Of course not, man. But like you say, of course not. But did that come natural to you? Did you have to work through that? And... How can people? How can people use that for their own their own personal lives? Because you you have to think to yourself, and especially in the work I do, even myself, sometimes it's so easy to get caught up on the little things yeah. and really stress your kind of stress yourself out, feel that pressure, and really look into things deeply when there's not even a problem there, but you create a problem. Yeah. So going through what you've been through, you've been homeless, you've traveled from one place to the next for a long time in this general world we live in, you didn't have much stability until you really went into foster care. Yeah. Uh, like, just tell, tell, how, how did you, how are you so positive? How, how do you continue to move forward in progress? And how did you not get dragged into something? You know what? Especially when living in these areas, say you did in Los Angeles and stuff like that, how do you not get dragged into it? I don't know if I'm making you think differently. So some questions somebody hasn't asked you before, but it's okay putting on like a persona and saying positive, you got to work hard, man, you got to do all this. But I want to know, I want to look deeper than that. Man. <sighs> Toughness, isn't it? Like, how do you not know if that toughness was always there, but then when you finally come into realization that that toughness is there, it's almost like you're aware of something. You know what I mean? Like, and when did that happen? Like, no, what I'm saying is like, I'm, I, I potentially must have been a tough kid throughout okay. my journey, even through all those, ex- uh, those, those, those ex- circumstances that was happening. But then what I'm saying is like, that toughness never broke me, never shook me, never put me, you know, never, never like, made me lay on the ground and give up. I never gave in to thinking that, oh, these are the end days, you know what I mean? Like, this is what my life is going to be like. Because deep down, yeah, like, there was, there, was, there was that point where 
sometimes like I just I just allow myself to guide myself through my journey like mm. I didn't try to control anything you trust the process I, yeah I just trusted myself like whatever it was whether that was me using learning how to use my mind learning how to speak to strangers or me trusting my instincts like or me trusting my intuition when I'm in a certain environment I'm like okay I might need to get out of here because there's something that's it's just not right yeah, yeah so I'm just, it's just it's just those little levels of awareness isn't it and most times it's like I couldn't respond to my circumstance in a negative way because if I did, you know, it's not gonna, it's not gonna make anything better, or it's not, it's not gonna make me get out my circumstance. Or it's not gonna escape me from the pain or escape me from my environment that I'm in. Like, I looked at the circumstance and I looked at people outside of me and I saw like the the the, the state that they was in and what they was doing to themselves or. However, they was as a person. I always told myself, I don't want to be that. I don't want wow. to be like that person. So you've used the kind of the hatred, the not the hatred. That's not the right word. You you seen the pain people was going through, and you use that as kind of a bit of a a motivational tool as well as being resilient anyway. But you use that as a motivational tool to actually say, I don't want to be like that. And you used that, and it kind of fueled you a little bit to not be like that. Yeah. To a certain, to a certain, certain extent. extent. Obviously, it goes a lot deeper than that, yeah. but that was still one thing. You, you, you see it now, right? Because you, even in our lives, there's sometimes you see things in your f- friends, your family, or you might see somebody drop some rubbish on the floor. Yeah. They don't think much of it. But for me personally, my morals, my values, I don't do that. Yeah. So when I see somebody do that, I'm just like, that looks so ugly. Yeah. Just the, it's, it's, the, the it's, level of disrespect that looks so ugly and I never want to look like that. Yeah, it's, it's almost like having low low morals or low levels of, of consciousness or even like low levels of respect to not just you but things outside of you as mm. well, you know? Like like I say, man, like being 12, 12 years old or 11 years old between our ages and, and experiencing what I experienced, I could say that I definitely found some toughness within there somewhere because like I said... It was a point where I had to learn how to, not even had to learn how to, but I had to find a way to take control of my journeys. Either I stay going down this path and this is what happens, or I either go into the unknown and try to navigate my way through that and navigating my way through that unknown, you know, I, I, I eventually find whatever it is that I'm looking for. So do you think when you was younger anyway, it's a case of kind of ignorance is bliss in a way? Does that kind of make sense? And what I say by that is you say you was just a tough kid, but really every experience you went through at the time is slowly building up your resilience. Yeah. Does that kind of make sense? So like, but your ignorance, you didn't know what was coming next. So one thing led to the next and so on and so forth. And then all of a sudden you're 15, 16 years old. Something difficult might come your way, but you've already been through so much. So yeah. nothing can phase you anymore. Exactly. It's, not, it's almost that bit like what they say. You can't put me through any worse than what I've already been through. You know what I mean? Like, I would Say it, say it in a cocky way, but it's no, just no, like no, that yeah. deep confidence that you just know. Like, plus you're taller than everyone, so <laughs> worst comes to worst, I'm tall. Shut up. But yeah, man, that's yeah, it's, it's interesting. Like, and that's why I want to go into motivational speaking, like, because I, I know there's there's like certain things that I I know that I can express in a way that touches somebody or that gets them moving thinking differently about mm. a challenge or adversity or even if even if you even if you think your life is going bad or you're you're underneath bad weather at the moment best believe the sunny days you know and there's those sunny days are going to come mm. but you got to learn the troop through your circumstance like a like a soldier or like a warrior you know what i mean mm. stuff like that so that's that's why I want to go into that Mm. And I'm excited. Like, I can't wait for that opportunity to come. Trust me. Imagine <laughs> what you, I'm looking for. Imagine you and me pulling up to a school. We look like the weirdest team ever, <laughs> won't we? <laughs> They're going to look at you like, uh, is he your agent or nah. is he your bouncer? Which <laughs> one is he? <laughs> That's true. Come like Floyd Mayweather. Yeah, yeah. I know, right? <laughs> um, 20 big big black men. Huh? <laughs> <laughs> so, oh, man. how is it playing ball over here? I'm a, obviously you're a professional basketball player. You get paid for it. Do you have the love for basketball, or is it just something you just you just do, and it gives you a lot of other experiences? To be honest, uh, I know probably Andreas probably wants to hear you say, <laughs> "I love basketball. Everything's basketball." But then be honest with me. 
Oh, I'm gonna be honest with you. No, I love. I've learned to love basketball. Put it like that. Like I've learned to as well, a means to an end type of it. Like not, yeah. not even that, but like me, like you know what? There's some things about the sport that I don't like, but then there's sometimes those things that you don't like be the things that you do love about why you're doing yeah. what you're doing. You know what I mean? Like there's 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 sometimes where like there's a certain part of you that's tested. You don't like that you're being tested, but you accept the fact that you're being tested because it's making you become a better individual, a better player. Resilience better again. That's all because it. one thing what we do as people, we tend to avoid what is difficult and what is hard. But actually, when you go after what is difficult and what is hard, that is where you build courage, that is where you build confidence, strength, and resilience. Mm. So one thing what we need to do, and it's, it's hard because the world we live in, everything is instant, everything is pretty, well, the country we live in and stuff and especially in England it's very comfortable you can just relax and be lazy and somewhat not all the time but you can still get through many things many mm. different situations because especially in school you always got a teacher on your case holding your hand through the process mm. but that's not always the case especially when you go into adulthood and then even in adulthood you might be working in a job but you're just you're just doing enough just not to get fired essentially oh, man, it's, just, it's almost like they don't want it's to like, put it yeah, yeah, yeah. It's it's like it's like a cycle. But if we develop a mindset and a mentality where we kind of learn to suffer a little bit, mm. we go after what is difficult. We go after what is hard because we know ultimately, if we go through that, experience it, and you will come out the other end, you are going to be a better person all mm. round. Mm. And and here's here's like to to go along with that statement that you just made. It's almost like. Those those lessons are meant to build your character, not meant to break you down or keep characters. You everything, come on, man. everything, come on, you, and that's it. that's speak a, that, it down, <laughs> speak it like <laughs> yeah. no, but what do you think? character is everything, and it comes back down to what I even said about dropping rubbish on the floor. Character is everything, and I talk about it in my sessions. I don't care what grades you got. I don't care. Mm. What I care about is the person you are and the person you're becoming. And that comes down to turning up on time. That comes down to being respectful for the teachers. That comes down to wearing the correct uniform. Because ultimately, those small things is your character. Are you lying? Do you lie to yourself? Do you lie to other people over trivial stuff? Mm. Well, it doesn't really matter, but you still lie. Mm. What does that say about your character? Because when something matter happens in your life, something big happens in your life, or say things hit the fan a little bit, how are you going to respond to that? Mm. Tell me, how are you going to respond it, to that? It's easy. It's easy. Me, come on. It's easy, it's easy to be a positive character when everything's all smooth. Oh, right? when you're tell going, me about when, you, when, you're on, when you're in the boat and you're on smooth water, you don't feel no tides. There's no no, it's true. You know what I mean? But. You know, how, when, when it comes to toughness or even like going through certain things, you know what I mean, and, and you're being tested in ways that alter your state of mind, it's almost like you got to learn to quiet yourself on the inside so you can be able to interpret what's going on outside of you. Wow. How can you. How can you take what's going on outside of you? How can you use it to benefit you? How can you use it to empower you, make you be wow. a better person or make you even just be somebody that appreciates these small lessons because the, at the end of the day, Life can be your greatest, you know, your greatest teacher. So, you know, it's it's like when you say respond, it's almost like you gotta you gotta know where you are. You gotta know if you you gotta first of all you gotta know your own mindset. You know, if if you don't know your own mindset and know your own behavior, within how do you become senses, aware of that though? If you, it's, you gotta know yourself. You gotta have a relationship with yourself. Come on, you know that. You know that. I do, but I'm playing devil's advocate. I'm okay. playing on the fence. So how do you know so, that? Yeah how, yeah, how do you know how that? Do you how know do that? you do that? Te teach people. Come on. You want me to teach? You want me to teach that? Come well, on. How, like, how, how do you develop that type of mindset? Okay, I know. I know what I've done. I know the process I've been through. I know my story, my challenges. But a lot of people are not aware. They're not aware. They have to start from somewhere. So how can you start becoming aware of yourself, of your attitude, of your mindset? How can you start doing that? What's the first step? Well, it's, it's, it's all internal, isn't it? It's, it's all about you opening up your own mind or giving yourself the opportunity to know you. Like, oftentimes, everybody is in a... St I wouldn't say everybody, but certain people are just living their lives being governed by things outside of them. 
rather than coming from within first. Mm. The moment you learn, now this isn't easy because every, every, everybody's journey to knowing themselves within starts off differently. Mm. You know, my journey with me knowing myself was when I started to like read books. In fact, I was a bit inspired by, um, by my, sis, my sister's stepdad. Like he, get, he had given me a book called The Power of Now by Urquhart Tolle. Yeah, yeah, I heard that. Oh, you heard that yeah, book? Yeah, yeah. Once, once I read that book, man, I, I just like, there's so many different things I learned and I was like, you know what? It, it taught me about meditation and mm. it taught me about like being in the moment, moment having intentions and everything you do and, and also reflecting and stuff like that exactly and when you're in the moment you you start to become aware of how you're thinking how do you feel you start to become aware of like your internal talk like a lot of it too is you know a lot of a lot of what goes on is people are stuck in a negative frame of thinking or innate and or have self-defeating language within their own internal internal dialogue if that makes sense like there's people that don't know how to handle themselves already and and they're already in a negative state of mind so anything outside of them that they perceive to be negative their 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 uh, response to that situation is going to be negative but if you already are aware of yourself and you already got yourself to the highest frame of thinking or the highest level of thinking then you will be able to be aware of yourself, what's going on within. You know how to respond to certain things that go on outside of you. And it's just like, there's that bit. And even if nothing's going on outside of you, there's that bit within you that's telling yourself, don't forget who I am. You know, there's that, there's that bit that tells you, I am, I, I know who I am. I know what I want to do. I, I'm, I'm always constantly working on me. There's, there, there's that element of the relationship as well where you're, where you're constantly working on yourself. There's that, okay, this isn't right. Okay, let me see what can I inwardly do to make sure that this is where I want to get it to. Like whether that's confidence, that's, that's believing in yourself or that's having that, that, um, that determination or that willpower. If you feel like you're failing here or if you tell yourself I'm failing, then you're also telling yourself, okay, it's okay, accept this failure, but take it as a learning lesson and figure out what can I do differently next. You do you set mean? goals and I have a plan? Do I set goals? Yeah. From time to time I do. Like, or is it because you're a professional basketball player right now, so everything's kind of in line with you right now, but do you have like a big vision of where you want to go in the future? Do I have a big? Because you can't be playing basketball forever. You're, oh, of course not. Like you're, you're massive, but and you're gonna, you're, <laughs> you're gonna, you're gonna stay massive, but you ain't gonna be able to ball forever. And looking at that, that shot you did in there, like yeah, you, you ain't got it, bro. <laughs> <laughs> you trying to disrespect my shooting ability? Right, nah, but I'm what's? Sorry, I'm, you may be lucky. I haven't asked you to shoot the basketball. Yeah, hey, I scored hey, first time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Anyway, yes, cut, yeah, cut, yeah. cut, uh, <laughs> cut that, please. Yeah, cut cut. That yeah, 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 yeah. So, do you have a big vision of what you want to do? Yeah, I definitely want to go into motivational speaking. Um, that's first and foremost. And then, I don't know, just give back any way that I can, whether it's through like an organization. I'm um, working with an organization right now that works with street children and tries to protect, wow. them, protect the rights for it. That's amazing. Um, yeah, it's deep. Like, it's really good. Like, it's, I think it's a really good organization simply because they, well, here's the thing I found out this past week, but they work underneath the UN. So, like, all the wow. all the countries that, yeah. you know, have information about street children problems, they send it to the organization, which is called, I always get this name mixed up, but it's Consortium for Street Children. What is it's, it? Consortium. Consortium. One more time. <laughs> oh, oh, no, no, no. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you yeah. try to get me tongue yeah, yeah, it's a consortium man. for street children and, they, and all the countries they report all the information to this um, organization and then they work underneath the UN to try and resolve the that's issue amazing. So it's big man it's big so that's what I'm looking to do for, with that organization and then also just do coaching mentoring um, and try to give back. I want to go into child advocacy. I want to own maybe a couple businesses or yeah, or cool. Yeah, just go. So for that, I'm know? fully aware you got training this evening, so I don't want to drag this on because I feel like we could really talk for a very long time. But what motivates you? What motivates me? Oh man, there's so many factors that motivate me, man. Like my reasons as to why I'm living, or even a little bit of my story, or even believing. Or, or not even believing, but knowing that now I finally step into the the area of having self confidence, and mm. knowing that where I came from, all of this didn't just happen for a reason. It, mm. didn't, it or it didn't happen for nothing. There's a there's a reason behind why I'm at where I'm at right now, and for everything that has just fell into, I don't know, has just fell in and all collaborated and mixed in together, like 
you know, that's that that's what inspires me to keep on going. And yeah, we we're, we're gonna come across failures. You know what I mean? I'm gonna come across failures. Nobody's perfect in this room. Do you ever but, get jealous? Jealous of what? Just in general. Of what? Say when you was in in school or if you was in Vegas, I don't know if you ever walked down a strip at the time and seen people have money <laughs> and you was homeless and that may, you might have been jealous from that or maybe if you was at um, school, people having their parents and you didn't even have your mum, stuff like that or even basketball, somebody's earning more money than you, whatever. Have, have you ever experienced jealousy? Don't lie to me. Have you ever experienced it? I've... Or like how, how people do have that. People do f- get jealous. Yeah, I would I wouldn't say it's jealousy, but it's more like competition. Yeah, not even competition. It's more like where you just kind of think, well, it would be nice to have that, you know. Like, like sometimes you think, oh, I wish I had something like that, just because like I probably need it more than that person had, more yeah. than that person does, you know. But, but I guess that's not jealousy. That's that's more it's envy. It sounds like the same, but it's not like envy isn't like jealousy. I feel it's quite. There's hate towards that, oh. but envy is more like, oh, like it would have been cool to have that yeah. or whatever. But you, you're not, you're not sat there thinking about it and seeing it as a negative thing. You're just, oh, that's cool, and then just moving on essentially. Yeah, no, I wouldn't say I had any sort of jealousy. No, I uh, maybe some envy, like for example, maybe not playing much. Like when I was in college, like I didn't play mm. a lot, so I wish I had some more minutes. But at the same time, I wasn't gonna carry those emotions and make it a burden mm. on other people around me. You know, like no, I wouldn't say I had that type of jealousy at all. I. I'm jealous. Why? Because you're tall, man. <laughs> oh, so you just want my height. Yeah, yeah. Oh, this guy. This guy um, just wants my height. So what does success look like to you? What does success look like to me? <sighs> success depends on what you want to make it, but if it depends for on... You. You for you. What's it for, for you? Me. I say it's learning how to believe in yourself when all the odds are stacked against you. Mmm. Mm. explain so in a sense where like okay like you said earlier you know the the stats the the statistics of people who was to make it out of my situations are either slim to none Mm. you know that that in itself is preach stacks Mm. it you want to put it more like double stacks triple stacks whatever that stacks against me but i find i found a way to navigate through all of that and i ended up overcoming that overcoming something on one of the smallest scales that anybody can ever think of. There's that. There's overcoming. Not too many kids make it out of the foster care system, you know. Like, either kids stay in the foster care system and they, after they're done, they revert back to how they was when they was younger or they don't have no sense of direction for themselves. Yeah, I, obviously, I even told you about um, told you about the, my friend I stayed in Los Angeles. So he's from foster care and he's a black kid and he was fostered into a white family. Mm. So he had two white parents who he sees as his mum and dad and they fostered three or, f- three or four different kids mm. at that time. But that it's funny how he's been through a lot. He's been homeless, he's lived out of his car, mm. but he still kept a positive mindset at the same time, just like... And keeps on going. Yeah. Is it, is but that, that, but maybe it is that some people do... Some people... <laughs> They, they struggle, don't they? So we all react to things differently. And whether that would be, say, depression or whether that would be seeing something more positively or going after your goal or dream or whatever it is, or it, I think it all depends on the character as well. Okay. And even potentially genetic makeup and also just how you respond to it. A lot of it is can be just mindset and just how you look at the world. What's your perspective of the world? Yeah. Does that kind of make sense? Yeah, that makes sense for sure. Um, because that's... So, so, so many of us like to look at things negatively. We do. we do. When you have a general conversation with people, you just have to sit back and actually listen to what people are telling you. And most of the time, it's not really anything positive <laughs> unless you unless you push that conversation forward. Yeah, yeah. So it's just trying to like... But then even when you do try to push it forward, sometimes it's uncomfortable to them. I know, because so, <laughs> if you if you got a big dream and they, got a, they don't have nothing, essentially... Mm they feel out of place because and they hate because you dream so big and they think so small so Mm. it makes them feel uncomfortable so automatically they don't want to be around you yeah you know which that's that's kind of uh 
It's kind of it's, it's a shame, isn't it? Because anybody that has a big mind or has a big vision, that should inspire you to try and learn how to build your own vision. Yeah, a lot but of people but, don't but, even but, have but a vision lot, for themselves. Yeah, nah, they don't. And that's why I talk a lot about people spend more time planning a holiday <laughs> to escape when they do their own lives. Yeah, is, so like, how do you not? I, when I ask you about goal setting or vision, that you already know. Okay, you might not necessarily set goals, but you got the vision in place, and you know you're gonna make decisions based on where you ultimately want to go. Mm. Where a lot of people don't have that. A lot of people feel like they got a glass ceiling over them, and they just simply don't have any aspirations. And because of that, what? How much growth do they make? They don't make nothing. They don't make nothing. But then at the same time, it's also like, what state of mind are they in? You know mm. what I mean? Are they thinking? Are they thinking? You gotta think how th- people think. Are they thinking just survival? If they think in survival, then they're only gonna think in survival mode. I just, I'm just doing enough to mm. survive, so I'm just gonna stay right here. But if you, if you learn to lock into your heart state of mind, your heart is gonna guide you wherever your desires are. It's gonna guide you. It's gonna give you that energy, that love, that that passion that you need to find within mm. your actions. And then if you learn to use your mind in a way where it's collaborated with like. All your all states of thinking, mm. or all your states of thinking, then your mind is gonna give you the possibilities. It's gonna give you the routes. It's gonna give you whatever it is that you need, you know, to guide you. It's gonna give you that logic sense of thinking. So then, when you see something, okay, that's let's say you see something. That's that's your angle. That's where you wanna be, right? All right, your heart is going in that direction as well. Now. You, you learn to use your mind because we all know if you use your mind properly, there's endless possibilities. You know what I mean? Like your mind and even if even if your mind cre- creates something and it fails, your mind is going to create something else. Uh, and even if that fails, it's going to create something yep. else. But at the same time, there's also that bitter by your heart. You know what I mean? Like that's a warrior. There's that. There's, your, your heart is a is like is like um it's what I say, it's a fire, it's a force, it's something that's going to give you what you need in the midst of dark times, you know, like, there's people that oftentimes forget what it means to have that love for themselves, or yep. that that compassion for themselves to tell you that it's okay, but I'm still here, you know, like, I, I inwardly, if I know I'm failing, or if I, if I don't succeed at something, I know where I want to get to, okay, that's fine, like, I have that that warmth about myself to say, keep on trying. Just like, trust the process. Trust yourself. Regardless of what comes up, you know ultimately you're going to get to where you want to get to. Exactly. And it's having that belief and, in place. And again, if even if you fail, you know what? That's fine. You know, do you think successful successful people that are where they're at right now, you think they didn't fail? Of course. Of countless of times? Come on now. Like, and I think that's what it is too. People are afraid of failure. They don't want to They don't want to know what it feels like to fail. Mm. And then, that, and then I'll, I'm, I'm always saying it, but a lot of people in today's world, they on a path where they want to go in a certain direction, but then they run into a wall, they run into a hump. Mm. And the hump can be so small. You know what they do? They look and they turn around and mm. they go right back to where they came from, which is complacency or serenity or the basic the basic terminology for it is comfort zone. Mm. You know, where they feel like this is what makes, you know, this is, I'm fine right here. But at the same time, you got to learn how to feed into your dreams and feed into your vision. like. Because at the end of the day, where you, where you see yourself, where your vision is, like you're going to have everything behind you. You're going to have everything that you need. But you first of all, you just got to find what you love doing. You know, you got to find your passion. And that's so, because um, we are tight on time, with that said, what I ask every guest, if you could sit down with any three people, dead or alive, what three people would you sit down next what to? What three people would I sit down with right now? Martin Luther King would be one. Okay. That's one. Um, Why? Just his words, you know. He just, there's a certain presence about him. There's a, the way he spoke to people and the way he moved people. Mm. The way he passed his dreams and it just makes sense and it touched you and it makes you actually want to do something. You know, it, he's a he, very influential and powerful person. Okay, perfect. Number two. Number two. I'll say, um, this is a tough one, actually. I was going to say Jim Cameron Rock. Parker, baby. <laughs> he, he did a good job, man. Life goal. Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no. Uh, I, I want to say, um, uh, you know who I actually like to hear, to be honest with you? Eric Thomas. Okay, cool. Yeah, I, like, I like his style of speaking. It's, it's, it's just like, oh, no, it's, it's just so, it's, it's beastie, you know yeah. what I mean? Have, like, you met, have you met Eric? No, I've never met him. I wish. Oh, I would love to meet him one day. Mm. Or even just like, go listen to him speak, you know mm. what I mean? Like, 
it's just he just get, there's something that he just passes on to where he just like I'm ready to go conquer something. You know mm. what I mean? Number three. Uh, number three. Um, Cameron Parker. <laughs> you know I'm already sitting with him right now, so it's not much of a problem. <laughs> number three. Come on, think. Number three. Oh man. Um, I'll say Les Brown. Okay. Oh, Les, wow. Yeah, Les Brown. Les Brown. He's a. He's an interesting story. He does. Mm. He does with with uh, people not believing in him. Mm. Not with wait with the teacher not believing in him and calling him retarded. And mm. It's just it's almost yeah. like, well, you can't call somebody that because now look at where he's at. Yeah, you it's just true. never know. It's true. Anyway, my man, I just want to say a massive thank you for joining me today. Yeah. There is going to be a part two. There needs to be a part there two. Needs to be. We've got your story out of the way. I feel like next time we need to sit down and talk a lot more about mindset and really get into it. But I thought it's very important to actually see where you have come from, the obstacles you have overcome and actually see your success as well. So I think that's incredible. So thank you for that and thank you for having the courage to share that story to other people and doing the work you're doing, not just the basketball side of things. That's sport, but I think it goes a lot deeper than that. Mm. So fair play to you. Um, where can people find you? Where can people find you? Tell you them where can they- find me on my Instagram page. You can find me on... Uh, what's the links? What's the, what's the name? <laughs> well, I actually got my second, my, my second motivational page now. It's called Mindful Motivation. Okay. And um, that one's more like my just my motivational mm. content that I want okay, to cool. stuff I'll, like that. You have to let me know and I'll, I'll pull it up. I'll oh, show it up. Okay, sounds good to me. And then I uh, appreciate that. And then I have my, my basic uh, Instagram page, which is D underscore Dozy42. You can find me there as well. And I'm going to be putting up some more stuff. And just okay, cool. There. Perfect. Yeah. So um, with that said, we're going to send put all the links under the video and on everything like that as well. Um, but yeah, just... We couldn't do this, obviously I've got a team, got Gadget Line, and obviously, of course, our special guest. We couldn't do this without you guys, so make sure that you do follow him on social media, follow me, hit the big red button, subscribe, listen to this, share this, like it, comment, you know what to do. And this is another fantastic episode of the Dreams to Reality podcast, I'm telling you now. There's going to be a lot of good things coming, for sure. A lot of good things coming. Hey, my favourite quote. Well, finish strong, go on. Tough times never last, but tough people do. You have to punch your chest. There you go. There you go. Peace. Peace. (laughs) Do you want to take a quick picture of